At this point, I'm going to ask Dr. Farnell to come up. He needs to uh, open up his laptop and get it ready, I believe. I first met our speaker through his writings in 1998. <clears throat> I hate mentioning his name again. He'll get the big head. Dr. Tommy Ice recommended a book to me called The Jesus Crisis. And that was an excellent uh, exposure to what is going on in the academic world of scholarship among evangelicals, where in very subtle ways they are denying the uh, inerrancy of, of the text. He co-authored that book with Dr. Robert Thomas, who was one of our keynote speakers here about 10 years ago. He is a professor at uh, the Master's Seminary. I know there's a bio for you up here somewhere. He did his master's work and <clears throat> at uh, Dallas Seminary, did his Ph.D. work in New Ta oh, excuse me, your MDiv and THM are from Talbot, and he did his Ph.D. work at Dallas uh, Theological Seminary. He served as a professor of biblical studies at Southeastern Bible College in Birmingham, Alabama, and also served as academic dean there. He has also uh, pastored uh, many churches, published extensively in books and periodicals, and is a host of the Danger Zone on Worldview Weekend Radio. He has co-authored a book called Vital Issues in Inerrancy. He co-authored with uh, Dr. Norm Geisler, and that price has been lowered to $28 on, is that on Amazon? 21 if you go If you go to Whippenstock, Whippenstock, you put the word inerrant. Yeah, inerrancy. I'd give it to you free. I really would. Yeah, if you go to Whippenstock.com, W-I-P-F-A-N-D-S-T-O-C-K.com, and type in inerrancy as the code, you will get the book. It's huge. It's, I mean, it's bigger than most phone books in Texas. And you'll get it for $21, and that's good until March 31st. So uh, we're running a little bit behind. You have about an hour and then a little time for questions. Is that good? Okay. Great. Come up, Dr. Farnell. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Do I need, can you hear me? No. no. Can you hear me now? There we go. No. Wait a minute. i got to push you up. Okay. <laughs> Where's the, uh, here we go. Okay. This goes oh, around your. Thank you. It just your, your, your I feel like Michael Jackson. Yeah. Here we go. Wait, 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 wait. You're not done yet. Okay. Okay, here. Well, go ahead and turn that up. Okay. Okay. Well, don't step up here. Just here. You just. Uh, so that is that okay? Yeah, no, just tuck this in. Okay. So that's okay. That's okay. Okay. Good, good. okay. Now can you hear me? That's good. Let me see if I can get this going. First of all, call me Dave. When I received my uh, terminal degree, they felt sorry for me and decided to do it anyway after I showed myself a complete idiot uh, at Dallas. So please call me Dave. Uh, I don't go by titles. When I'm done with this, uh, you may want to call me other things. I'm glad <laughs> that Dr. Dean took the offering before I spoke because... <laughs> You may ask for your money back. Now I can't, this is terrible. I cannot find, I cannot find my presentation. It disappeared from my, that is interesting. It was there. I can't do this without that. Hang on one second. I have a flash drive. Um, that is weird that it disappeared. There's a hole. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I had that right ready to go. Let me, let me search for it and find it. I apologize. I now have 50 minutes. Uh, okay, I'll use this because it's on here. Is it really? How would I go like try? Yes, you're right. Thank you. And it sounds like the speaker is loaded too, but I don't know. All right. <laughs> Let's go back up. Now, first of all, let me go here. This is, no, that's, that's not the right one. Is it the right one? 
hang on one second because it's got to be the there we go now okay sorry all right now I hit this there's my mouse all right I'm usually not this disorganized it's much more okay hi I'm Dave Ah. Uh, I am a teacher at the Master's Seminary. I have to ask a question, though. You won't hold that against me, will you? I know what you're asking. Free grace or lordship, aren't you? <laughs> well, I'm neither. I'm what they call a biblicist, and if Paul said, if it is by grace, it is no longer by works, otherwise grace is no longer grace, right? So I don't care what terms, I just know one thing, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that, and that, that, summarizes it all. It's called, let me, let me throw some technical terms at you, neuter bracket clause, which means it's all. So I just quote scripture, and then everybody gets mad at me anyway. <laughs> at Master's Seminary, I'm known as the eccentric professor, I kid you not. I have a sense of humor. Um, <laughs> We'll see if it goes over tonight. <laughs> now, I can, I'm, but to be honest with you, I can perform a miracle in front of you tonight if you'll participate with me. Will you do that? How many of you are from Texas? How many from the Houston area? Will you say three words with me and I can increase our audience by 10,000 on the internet? You have to trust me, okay? This is gonna be a miracle. Are you ready? Ready? Say this with me. Alu Akbar, Jihad. <laughs> now why would that do that? <laughs> because now all the intelligence officers throughout our country, <laughs> the British MI6 and the Israeli Mossad are now all listening. So we want to welcome them this evening to learn about inerrancy. Good to be in Texas because that just teaches me the, those that didn't laugh are clothes concealing tonight. <laughs> so we begin. By the way, that is my school picture. Let me show you what I look, uh, look like in real life after my wife applies two hours of makeup or before, excuse me, before. There I am. <laughs> Maybelline. All right. All right, my wife said I shouldn't do that. We begin. <laughs> um, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. I'll give you the good news first. Anybody belong to the Evangelical Theological Society here? Not SBL, ETS. Okay, I've got some wonderful news for you. In 20, uh, 2010, 4,200 of our elite scholars in our seminaries sign the elite now and they're, if they're really elite they go to Society of Biblical Literature they won't let me in either building when they're there but they go there I'm more like a junkyard dog professor if you know what I mean and 4200 of them signed the ETS Evangelical Theological Society doctrinal statement here is what it simply is I believe in the inerrancy of Scripture Okay, isn't that great? 4,200, all of them, especially what they call, and here's a term you're gonna have to learn, evangelical critical scholars. Have you ever heard that term? Ooh, you need to learn that term because that's the elite of the elite. Again, they won't let, as Groucho Marx said, I wouldn't belong to any club that would have me as a member and they won't, they won't call me by that. I'm the junkyard dog guy and I don't go, uh, you, you ever seen the Disney show where the apocryphal story of the lemmings? You wanna know what ETS and SBL are like? You really wanna know? You think all those guys with those titles? You ever see the Disney where they had the lemmings and the lemmings would all be following each other? And you'd have this one lemming and that's the evangelical critical scholar. The rest of them are all those that attend 
and the evangelical critical scholar, he's the main lemming. There could be three or four of these big lemmings and all the little lemmings, I gotta stay in focus on here, but all the lemmings will follow them and then they go off the cliff, okay? You just learn what we're facing. Even though I hear the lemming story is apocryphal. Um, <laughs> this one isn't though. Not only that, but when they say the word inerrancy, keep the illustration of lemmings now, they say that they use at ETS the International uh, Council on Biblical Inerrancy. I was just a young seminarian. Now I'm 29. And I remember every year they laugh more and more when I say that. I don't know what that means, but I must be showing the age. They, they agree. They say they use it as a guide. 1978, I remember my professors all flying to Chicago because the whole theological world was melting down. How many of you remember the most hated book in the world, Harold Lenzel's Battle for the Bible? Well, I've, I appreciated that book. It was the first book my professors made me read. And now, among evangelical critical scholars, I would call that the most hated book. It's divisive. We can't have that. Um, however... Now I gotta tell you the bad news. 4,200, they, they use it as a guide. And I have no idea what they even mean by the term inerrancy. And what's going on today is the elite of the elite are seeking to add surreptitiously, in my personal opinion, a definition of inerrancy along these lines. The Bible is inerrant so long as you understand that it's a book written in ancient times and ancients didn't quite have our standards that we have that we have today so they have some inaccuracies in it and they didn't care about being accurate and if you understand that the Bible is inerrant. Now I'm going to show you this you're not going to believe me at first. Um, but that is what is going on today. They will say this. The Gospels have the footprints of Jesus in them. So go down to Galveston, look at some footprints, and tell me all the things you know about somebody's footprints and the person that made those. Tell me everything you know. How about this? The best we can say about the Gospels? You ready? They're generally reliable. Well, doesn't that fill you with... Can't you imagine giving an altar call? I want you to come forward because we know by applying criteria of authenticity, and that's another one we'll get into, and don't worry about the term, I'll explain, that the Bible is generally reliable. Believe on Jesus. I'm sure that it would be lined with people. General reliability of the Gospels, that's the best we can say. They say that there are key events, 12 of them, that might have probably happened. <laughs> and the liberals will apply the same criteria and go, they didn't happen. So guess who loses in that? It's the Bible that's made to look bad. Because they're capitulating. Remember, the elite critical scholars lead the way and the lemmings, other lemmings follow and they go off the cliff. And that's what's going on. They now say Jesus was resurrected, probably. If you think I'm kidding, I'm going to show you quotes. And I'll probably make you mad because some professor that you had in seminary might say this. I already got myself in trouble, I understand, at the pre-trib when I spoke about a professor at a seminary. And you can challenge me. By the way, whoever said you can't interrupt preachers? At my church, if you, you throw a red flag on the field and say, hey, wait a second, Dave. Why did you just say what you said? It doesn't bother me. If I can't prove what I'm telling you, you have a right to interrupt me. So start the questions and answers now. It won't bother me. But I understand this is a Kevlar pulpit, right? <laughs> I'll do it. Uh, let's see. Jesus was resurrected, probably. But the resurrection of the saints didn't happen. The death of Jesus may be an allegory. Can't prove it with certainty. 
Jesus, when, remember when Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my what? Shall not, no, no, it's the gist of what Jesus said will not pass away. Then that, can you, can you say that as a preacher? You know, you're in the pulpit. The gist of what Jesus said is true. Doesn't that give you power to do that? There is no such thing as certainty in the Bible anymore. By the way, uh, some will say, Paul didn't write some books of the New Testament that bear his name. But that's okay. That's anonymity, they call it. And it was a Pauline imitator, but he knew Paul or at least lived close enough to get Paul's thoughts. Oh, I kid you not. Jonah is a parable. Job was not real. Three Isaiahs, two Daniels. You remember that? But they say they all can be squared with inerrancy. Now, when I was in seminary, I didn't know anybody that could square that with inerrancy. But I'm not an evangelical critical scholar, and I didn't go to a prestigious school in Europe, Britain, or Germany. And I'm going to hit that too. The reason why our seminaries are failing is that we are sending our men for prestigious degrees. And those of you who have a ranch, I'll tell you a story. There was a politician that came to a ranch. This is for Danny because I met him today. I wasn't planning on doing this. My wife said, be careful with your jokes. Okay. <laughs> and the politician uh, was on a ranch in Texas and uh, promising them a chicken in every pot. And they were German ranchers, so they were yelling every time he would promise them something, Gesichte! Gesichte! And the guy didn't know what it means, and so uh, the uh, farmer took him to show him his prize cattle. And as he was being shown that, they said, oh, by the way, don't step in the Gesichte. That's, <laughs> that's what they're doing with these evangelical critical... See, as an introduction, and I'll be here three nights, maybe only through tonight right now, because Dr. Dean is probably going. <laughs> Dangerous thing is a fundamentalist with a sense of humor. But put the fun back into fundamentalism, okay? <laughs> anyway, I forgot what I was going to say, but that may be what I was uh, How about this? Genesis 1 through 3, while the words are inspired, only thing that is inerrant about Genesis 1 through 3 is its purpose. Its purpose was to show you God created it, but don't dare go there to find out how he did it. So, what are we facing? That's exactly what we're facing. I'll try to show it to you. And, um, you know, it, there comes a point where you have to either stand for the word of God and what our Lord said. James warned, teachers have the greater judgment. I wonder sometimes if these evangelical critical scholars truly understand that warning. So let's get into this. It says shockwaves. Oh, it is a shockwave. And it'll take me three nights just to get through this. Because, you know, I find as I do this, it's not the precious people in the pew. <laughs> It's the guys that are the elite scholars. You see, if you want to believe the Bible today, there's a price you pay. If you believe the Bible, especially inerrancy, you are an idiot in the elite world. There's an inverse proportion. The more you believe God's word, the less the world accepts you. And there are some guys that, frankly, it's my personal opinion. They don't want to go that way because they will never have a reputable, professional opportunity. Well, I'm going to use some unbiblical terms. You need to be sold out and surrendered to Jesus Christ. That's it. That means Jesus said, if they hated me, they will what? Hate you. And that's the way it is. So let's get into this. What unbelief does? What is causing this? Well, they get into what is known as historical critical ideologies. And I'm not throwing that term around to confuse you. How many have ever heard of grape nuts? 
then you understand what historical criticism is. Grape nuts is neither grapes nor nuts. That's an old preacher thing. What is historical? It's neither history nor critical. It wants to impose itself on the Bible and make the Bible acceptable to the person's mind. It won't do that. And that's what that is. It's a this morning, I think, with Dr. House, you got grammatical historical, right? You take grammar, Greek and Hebrew, English even, and you ter interpret the Bible plainly, normally. Unless the common sense of Scripture doesn't make sense. There, there is hyperbole. David said, I cried uh, and my Tears floated my bed away. Well, we know that he's speaking with a little bit of exaggeration there. So, but common sense. That's what's causing it, first of all. Do not let your men get into historical critical ideologies. Grape nuts. It's a matter of hermeneutics. And we are in a meltdown at all the... And I can't speak for Schaefer because I haven't had much experience with it. But I can speak for the major evangelical seminaries read that book, I would give it to you free. Vital Issues in the Inerrancy Debate, put the word inerrant in, get it for 21 bucks, and I can speak that the, what we are experiencing today is nothing but what we experienced at the turn of the 20th century, why? They were sending their men to Europe, in that case, Germany. Today, the very same things are happening, but Germany is eclipsed, and it's the mamby-pamby Brits. Now, before you get mad at me for that, if you're British, I came from Staffordshire County in my ancestry, and I'm a Brit. But the Brits are lukewarm. They find the Germans very interesting and like them, but if they went the full German way of unbelief, that's why I like the Germans. Yet, or at nine. You know, they just will tell you, but the Brits will modify it. And they'll seek a middle ground. And Jesus said, remember, I'd rather have you totally cold or what? Totally hot. And so I don't like the British scholarship because they come and they do all, well, I'm going to show it to you. Then we have what's called a fancy postmodernistic historiography. Ooh, that means the writing of history. You know what that means? It means there is no such thing as history today to our uh, scholars. Uh, some uh, Germans, Heidegger and, uh, and Nietzsche started this. But what happens, you send them to Europe, and guess what? They have a, what I call a psychological operation done on them. They have no idea what's happened to them. Those of you who are in the military know what psychological operations are. The best way to defeat the enemy is before you fire a shot. The best general is the one that can defeat the enemy without losing his own men and firing a shot. That's how they do it. Because education, all education, is a psychological operation designed to get you to think a certain way. So you better be faithful to God's word or you're going to influence people. Anyway, and then we have that pseudepigraphy. I'm going to skip real quick, but here is a typical New York University class where all of this is there. Now, I'd expect New York University to do all of these things. I would expect nothing more than that. And I don't know if you can see it too well. There it is. And there is, they read Bart Ehrman, who is the uh, poster boy for getting out of Bible belief, and they do all of this. And they, I expect that at New York University. However, I'm going to show you that evangelical critical scholars, and by the way, they don't like me. Some have implied in the book that because I hold to a firm view of the Bible that they have implied indirectly, carefully, so I don't care. It doesn't bother me what names they call me, that uh, you know, if you follow my way of interpreting, you could be a Nazi or a commie. <laughs> Why insult those people put me in their camp? I don't know. <laughs> but you'll find the same things we just talked about. The difference between evangelicals and liberals is narrowing. And here is what I really want you to understand as we go through this for the next three days. Don't get lost too much in what we do. Just remember this. What will this do to the preachers that will fill your pulpits? 
you're going to notice a big difference because the seminaries that you feed from for your pastors are going to lose their fire in the belly. I get reports from guys that go to, uh, they come from China, India. They come to seminaries in our country. They get a full ride and then they get into historical criticism and all this stuff I'm going to talk about. And you know what they end up doing? I've been reported from guys that are over there. They don't want to be preachers anymore. They'd rather go into business because they don't believe the word of God. And that's what's happening. At our finest, forget not talking about liberals, at our finest evangelical seminaries that if I mention names, you're going to know who they are. They're going down. And they're going down fast. I had a church history professor that told me this and I never forgot it. Any seminary in its third generation will be gone. Why? The first generation fought the battle. Second generation heard about the battle. Third generation, they don't care. And then the president will have a scholarship fund to send their boys to Europe because we want our seminary to be prestigious. Why can't we have it both ways? No, in my personal opinion. You can't. You're either God's man or you're a man of the world. Now that's what it is. So we get into this. The status question is fancy term for where were we at? It's like tale of two cities. It was the best of times in evangelicalism. It was the worst of times. James 3.1 reminds us not many of us should become teachers. Great to have preachers, but be very careful when you start teaching because you receive, boy, that scares me. When I stand before the Lord, do we know that it's not talking about the lady in the pew. Ladies, your husband ever uses this on you for rumor. Don't, it doesn't apply to me. It's you as a teacher. That's what you tell them. It's teachers. And look what it says. Does a fountain send forth from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? In other words, the Bible is inerrant. As long as you understand it uh, was written by a bunch of men who, you know, they weren't concerned with accuracy there's that mixed that you're going to see the hot the cold and that's what's going on can a fig tree my brethren produce olives how about vine produce figs see a teacher must be consistent in what he teaches and you know students are very impressionable Jesus said to the Pharisees woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites you travel on land and sea when you find a disciple you make him twice as much a son of what he used the word Gehenna Jesus knew what teachers, how they can influence <coughs> students. So we're asking this question as we go through this. What's this going to do to the pulpits and its impact upon God's people? By the way, Jesus said it is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and his slave like his master. M look, I don't follow any scholar. The only one I follow, and I really mean this, this is why I make everybody mad. I probably will make you mad. I'll go mention somebody you know, and then I'm going to make you mad. But I have decided long ago that I will honor the Lord no matter what. And if you don't, know, what can I do? And we need more people in seminaries that teach their guys that. You want to know what evangelical it is? Pig with lipstick. You can understand that. That's what it is. Next time somebody says historical, critical, just go, it's a pig with lipstick. <laughs> By the way, lordship in the sense of Jesus is Lord needs to reign over scholarship, right? And here's another one for you as we wind into this, and I know I don't have too much time tonight, but those who do not learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat the failures of the past. And that's what we're seeing. I can tell you at the turn of the 20th century, our evangelical groups split off from the mainline denominations. They were facing the very same thing that we are facing today. They formed seminaries. They formed Bible colleges. You probably have been, you're here because of that. And guess what happened at the turn of the 21st century? The very same things are back. I read the fundamentals. Do you ever read the fundamentals from Biola? R.A. Torrey? Well, here. I would give you this book free. I do not 
I honestly think it may be wrong for preachers sell things. I really want to, I, but they won't let me. But I will give you, and Dr. Dean can somehow arrange for this, if you want the Jesus Quest, not the crisis, publish. But Dr. Geisler and I did that. We didn't want a publisher holding it because the information is too valuable and we want Dr. Geisler's a type, he wants his books out there as cheaply as possible. So if you text him, I gave him the PDF of the book, that what I can give free, because we don't have a publisher wanting his shekels from it, okay? The Jesus Quest, not the crisis, which will show you what's happening. I could wish I could give you that. There are the two books, that the one on the right, your right, is what I can give you free, no cost. Now, I'm going to skip that. I've done enough. Now, we get to the 19th century, and the Southern Baptist is it a good example of what's happening today. How many have ever heard of Professor Toy? Okay. Well, it's too bad. Most seminary guys would know about this, but Toy was a Southern Baptist professor at Southern, got in there, and a nice guy. They didn't want to do anything about it. Nice guy. And he set the Southern Baptist groups into a spin and they didn't recover from it for a hundred years because someone didn't have the chutzpah, the moxie, to deal with it. And the uh, Paul R. House, is that Wayne House's brother? Or is that just a common name? Just thought about that. The weight of any theologian's under, uh, underlying hermeneutical presuppositions is monumental. What does that mean? How you interpret the Bible impacts what you think of the Bible. If you interpret plainly normally, it'll impact you. If you mess with it, with pigs with lipstick and grape nuts, it, it will impact what you think. And Toy is an example he did not realize or didn't admit he was an evolutionist. By the way, evolution is back. I know a famous seminary and an article that said they now think Genesis is poetic history. There's, so you got the choice of poetic fiction and the way I believe it, it's history of what actually happened. I'm a six-day creationist. Make no bones about it. I have a guy at my church. He finds soft tissue in dinosaur bones. How do you do that after 65 million years? You don't. Toy did not realize or wouldn't admit how he interpreted the Bible was impacting and he took the Southern Baptist. He divided spiritual truth from historical matters. That's what our men are doing today. He said the gems of truth are indeed divine, but the casket, the words, are human workmanship. I'm going to show you that today. Well, in the series. He argued that spiritual truth of Scripture are not eliminated by scientific discovery. In other words, he accepted that we evolved from monkeys. By the way, do you know where John Knox, the great Presbyterian reformer, is buried in England? He's in a parking lot in Scotland. They run over him with those little cars. Guess where they put Darwin, who did more to damage the church than any other? You know where they put him? In Westminster Abbey, those crazy Brits. And then we send our men there to be put on fire for God in Britain. Now they're turning British... Uh, cathedrals into mosques, restaurants, dance halls. They're bringing back disco and everything else. And we send our men there because that's where the great men are trained. And then they come back and our men are no longer on fire for God in seminaries. They lose their spiritual passion. So I probably made you mad. He made, we'll go through the plain sense of scripture is secondary. <laughs> we'll go on toy. Just remember that. So, the big picture. Most of these following that I'm going to talk about, I'm a junkyard dog compared to these guys. They would never have taken me at these prestigious schools. I couldn't qualify. Couldn't afford the tuition, let alone qualify. So, all you've got is a junkyard dog who will just ask you to consider this. What will happen to our churches? Our men of God that used to preach the power of God's word through the filling of God's spirit. By the way, that is the key to good preaching. In Acts 1 through 11, you know what made Peter great? Who was called, what were Peter and John called? Untrained and unlearned, ignorant. And you know what put them on fire? The filling of God's spirit. 
So the good news is we have great evangelical critical scholars and they all profess inerrancy. Most of these evangelical critical scholars associate them in some way with views that were never a part of orthodox inerrancy and say they, I guess, in my thinking, must feel that they can reconcile it. Good luck with that. Thus, the orthodox view of inerrancy is now being changed, and here's what they're attempting to do. You know, the neo-orthodox did this, and it was smart. You know, the German liberals got in, and they said, we do not believe this. Ich glaube es nicht. They don't believe it. I can go with a guy like that. You know, I want to know where you stand. But today, they're like the neo-orthodox. If I said the word inerrancy to you, you would all go, amen. I know. I can tell by this group. But now you've got to ask these critical evangelical scholars, you ready? What do you mean by that? Because they're trying to substitute by surreptitious, in my personal opinion, an aberrant definition of the Bible as inerrant so long as you understand that there are errors in it. <laughs> now they'd go, don't listen to that junkyard dog. He's, oh. But I'm telling you that, now here's the goal. Substitute, just like Bart in the neo-orthodox, use the term. See, that's smart. Why assault the doctrine if you can do it carefully, secretly, behind the scenes? You see, the danger is never from without in God's church. I have Russian kids whose dads were in hiding from KGB. The church was strong and alive. But I know now that Russia is being imploded by critical evangelical scholars and all of these cults, and the danger has always been from within. So, uh, please go if you want to learn more about this in between sessions to defendinginerrancy.com. Let's take a quiz. See, professors always give a quiz. So, real quick, here's the quiz. True or false? In Matthew 27, 45 through 54, there was an actual resurrection of the saints at Jesus' death. True or false? Just put, you can think about it, you know. We're going to grade this. The answer is false. That was, that was Jewish apocalyptic, and you didn't get trained in prominent European or South African schools to recognize it. Now, please, the answer is false. So if you said true, give yourself a zero. Next. An actual visit of the Magi occurred when Jesus was born as a child. True or false? The answer is false. If you said true, you are not a critically trained evangelical scholar. Um, three, King Herod actually killed babies in Bethlehem. True or false? The answer is false. Obviously, you guys aren't doing too well. Uh, Paul wrote Ephesians. False. Uh, Paul wrote Colossians. I like challenge like that. Okay. <laughs> Paul wrote the pastoral epistles. Maybe. Jonah was actually swallowed by, now I said a whale, and the last time I got caught, I'm not trying to be tricky, fish, okay? I remember going, well, you said whale. Okay, I, some fish that God made special for whatever, okay? True or false? The answer is false. It wasn't. It's a parable. Jonah was a real person. It's false. He was a parable. Uh, the one prophet Isaiah wrote the whole book. That's false. There are at least two or three Isaiahs. And I can square that with inerrancy. Although I personally don't believe that myself. Oh, you wait till I'm done. No, that wasn't talking about me. But I'm just giving you a little bit. Wait, I'm going to prove all of this. Show you. you. They gave me two more nights of this. So, well, maybe. Um, God created the earth by speaking it into existence. That's false. It's poetic history. Pick and choose. See, when they say poetic history, that means you pick and choose what you like about Genesis. And if you don't like it, throw it out. It's the poetry part. That's their hermeneutic now. True or false? God created the world in six literal days. It's false. You cannot take from Genesis anything about how God created the world. The only thing that Genesis tells us is how God created it. Next. Twelve. What the gospel records of Jesus actually happened in the way it was recorded. False. Uh, the gospel accounts have information that probably happened but still might not have happened. That was a trick question. Okay. The gospels are actual historical accounts of Jesus' life. False. Adam and Eve were actual historical people and not monkeys. That's false. They were pre-Adamic hominid that God breathed into the breath of life with. Every major evangelical seminary this is based off of. 
I'm going to prove it to you. You're going to be mad at me because you're going to have a friend at one of these and you're going to go, Dr. Dean, don't ever let that man be here. That's okay. I get thrown out of every place. That's my wife. Okay, here. If you scored zero, praise God for you. <laughs> if you scored anything above that, you're on your way to becoming a critical evangelical. So I see what they mean by this is this. God's word, in my personal opinion, this is what they mean. God's word, word will not judge me. I will judge it. Ooh. So anyway, Jesus' warning, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Well, we'll see, because if this trend continues, and it's very bad, and I'm going to skip through that, Paul's warning, preach the word, for the time will come. They're not going to endure it. The word sound there in, in the uh, original means healthy doctrine. What's healthy doctrine? You just preach what the Bible says. Let the chips fall where they may. But they're too, no, they don't want that. You can't, you can't have academic respectability and believe in solar day creation. Well, I'll tell you what they can do with SBL. I can't tell you. It would get me in trouble. <laughs> By the way, when they turn to anything but the biblical Jesus, see that word myth there? You preach anything but the certainty of God's word and the biblical Jesus, you have turned aside to a myth. But e evangelical critical scholars I mean that would you know, it wouldn't go over sometimes what the impact on the pulpit or pew not the marines but God is looking for some faithful men and it takes courage all scripture is inspired okay here is just one example now let me tell you this these men are much more brilliant than I am I'm an idiot ask my wife she'll tell you no kidding that's probably one of the nicer things she calls me. Anyway, I, had, I use his grammar. He knows thousands of times more. He's brilliant. And I'm a junkyard dog. And that's probably the nicest thing that these guys, because I mention names. David, why do you do that? Because I am called to be God's man warning God's church. And I have decided, I don't care whether you like me or not. I'm not afraid of you. I think pre preachers need to fear God. And I'm, I fear God that if I don't warn you, and preachers need to fear God, there's too much fear of men. I don't care what SBL thinks, and I don't care what ETS thinks. You know, when you, forgive me, if you have a doctorate, I don't mean this personally, but when you name people doctor, we give them master's degrees, we give them doctorates. You know what that does to people? We march them. Jesus said about the Pharisees, they love to broaden the phylacteries of their garments. So what do we do? We march them down. Forgive me. We march them down, we call them masters, we give them doctorates, then we have prestigious degrees. And uh, you know the original sin? Pride. I just, whoops, I just get myself wondering, and I know I make my own seminary mad, because every seminary does it, but have we spiritually thought about what we do? Because Jesus said the greatest of you will be what? An evangelical critical scholar from the halls of Oxford, Cambridge, and Aberdeen, and Edinburgh. Or did Jesus say, the greatest of you shall be a what? Well, you won't get any prestige out of that. Well, let's talk about, again, he's, uh, this guy is so much above me. But here it says, the emphasis on knowledge above relationships can produce in us bibliolatry. Do, do you believe you can commit bibliolatry, make an uh, idol out of God's word? That, for me as a New Testament professor, the text is my task, but I made it my God, the text became my idol. Let me state this bluntly, the Bible is not a member of the Trinity. Well, that may sound pretty good, but you've got to think about that. One of the great legacies said is Karl Barth, who left behind his strong Christocentric uh, focus. But Karl Barth redefined what a Christocentric focus was because he was neo-orthodox. He was Kierkegaardian existentials, which means this, whatever it meant to him is what it means. Well, if the Bible is not inspired and inerrant, how can you hope that the Bible can be trustworthy in its Christological focus? And as I read today's historical critical evangelicals, I'm not hitting the liberals. Judgment begins where? I'm tired of evangelicals and fundamentalists talking about the liberals. I expect them to do this. Judgment begins with God's people, but nobody's willing to self-introspect. Here, 
Dr. Geisler and William Roach. Roach, they're both my friends, good friends. I write with both of them. We're writing another book, if I can ever find a publisher. Good luck with that. Uh, it's another book that will make me unpopular, and I get no money from these books, trust me. Uh, he wrote Defending Inerrancy because it came up to the anniversary of the ICBI, and he knew, boy, if anybody knows what's going on, it's Storm and Norman. And that's why I always admired him, because he was not afraid to get up, I remember at ETS when I was just a young guy, he was never afraid to get up and defend God's word and let the chips fall where they may. I like a guy like that. I knew where he stood. But they mocked that book. This is going to be the proof that I'm telling you that they're trying to redefine inerrancy toward another definition that is absolutely unacceptable. Forward is by Dr. Craig Blomberg of Denver Seminary supporting it. Now, that's just factual. That's a fact. Affirming a defensible faith for a new generation. In other words, they're now wanting to what? Define. Well, you say to me, well, I, remember, I thought it meant without error. <laughs> hmm. They want to define it. And it was written by some guy, and I don't know really too much about the one, Nick Holding, uh, Tectonics Apologetics, I think, is his site, and Nick Peters, who is one of the son-in-laws of a guy I'm going to talk about. Here is Dan Wallace praising, defining inerrancy. What do you mean? I thought, Dan, we defined it. Well, that's your definition. Don't you force your definition on me. Well, I can understand that. Wallace notes, in sum, defining inerrancy is a book far more important than its size, not defending, defining. Get that close. It defines not only inerrancy, but a yawning divide within evangelicalism. My hope is that traditionalists, how many of you believe when you say the Bible is without error, it means what he said, you'd say amen. amen. You're a traditionalist. See how they like the name call? I'm a junkyard dog. If I'm going to call a name, it's going to be me. I'm going to call me the name. I'm a junkyard dog. I'm not a critically evangelical scholar. I'm, to them, I'm an idiot. That's nicest that they would probably call me, but my hope is that traditionalists will not dismiss it out of hand as they do so many treatments coming from the contextualizing inerrantists. They contextualize things, see? They have the proper view on the text, I guess, but will indeed wrestle serious with its content. Sadly, I'm not holding my breath. He reviewed it and was positive. Now, that doesn't mean he's a bad guy. It just means I don't want to redefine inerrancy. You know how many people participated in the inerrancy? 400 men went to Chicago to do that. Well, why? They fought what we're fighting right now. But the young guys don't want to, want to listen to the older guys. You know what I mean? So, kind of like, was it Rehoboam or Jeroboam listened to his young guys? Rehoboam. There you go. Thanks. And they said some bad advice. Uh, the view making inerrancy as important as the resurrection of Christ is a domino view. It's brittle fundamentalism. Now, Daniel didn't say that, but somebody else did that. Because Daniel quotes Daryl Bach of Dallas Seminary calling it brittle fundamentalism. Well, put the fun back into fundamentalism. I'm for that. But... They still see things in black and white. Well, either the Bible is true or it's not. Yes. Or close your Bibles and go home. They still see things in black and white, but are now are skeptical about the supernatural. Anything that smacks of biblical authority. Daryl Bach speaks of such a mentality as brittle fundamentalism. And he sees it as shattering when it comes to contact with sophisticated pol uh, polemics. That's a fancy word for arguments. So what I guess they're saying here is when you come with, against some of these liberal scholars why we look like idiots and I should wear Billy Bob teeth right now because I'm one of those uh, that idiots that believe the Bible and what he's saying what they're saying here I guess is if I don't understand their argument I'm just too stupid so where I, I wish I would have bought before I came and I would have had the Billy Bob teeth on for you they can call me names all they want sticks and stones I will warn God's church of course I don't say I have a prophet, and I don't want to be, because what happened to every prophet of God? <laughs> okay. By the way, 
If inerrancy is a peripheral belief, like it was just said, then how in the wide world could Christology be a central focus? Because if the document that witnesses to Christology isn't inerrant and authoritative and inspired, how in the wide world can it be accurate on Christology? He says this, and you heard this one speaker today. I think it was today or it's tomorrow. Our theology is often too rooted in Greek philosophy, rationalism, the Enlightenment, and Scottish sense, common realism. Now, in my day when I was a kid, that was what they were touting in the book. Um, oh, come on. Um, McKim. Um, come on, McKim and come on. I, I, uh, Rogers and McKim, thank you. The old man, it's before, ap, after my bedtime, I guess, anymore. So um, <laughs> now they're, they're, you know, they're starting to say, well, where? Where is this? I want to know. Where is this? Roger, there it was right in front of me, Roger Zingham. <laughs> see, I'm proving that I'm the idiot, so you know what I mean. Let's see. What I, what? What did you want? <laughs> what, did you want me to go back? Why did you go, woo? Oh, okay, I know. Um, Barb uh, made my slide so much better than I do. But um, anyway, but there's a lot that I have to tell you here. She's laughing real hard. Look at that idiot with those slides. Look, what I tell, here's what, here's what seminary professors are telling their students, at least one of them. What I tell my students every year is it is imperative that they pursue truth rather than protect their presuppositions. And they need to have a doctrinal taxonomy. Whoa, that's a fad. hierarchy or, you know, where that distinguishes core beliefs from peripheral beliefs. When they place more peripheral doctrines as inerrancy and verbal inspiration at the core, when then belief in these doctrines start to erode, it creates a domino effect. One falls down, they all fall down. So what does he say? Put Jesus in the center. Now, doesn't that sound great? Put Jesus in the center of your Christianity. But if the documents that witness to him have problems in them and they're not inerrant, why would you put Jesus in the center? How could you? See, that sounds good unless you look, watch them closely, read critically. And I know I'm upsetting people. I use the grammar. It's the best grammar in the world. Uh, J.P. Moreland, he says we're too overcommitted to the Bible. By the he wrote an article on overcommitment to the Bible. He says he can be misunderstood, but he sees overcommitment to the Bible as harming the church. So stop that! By the way, they just named him the 30th, ranked 30th in the best schools. I found out what the best school was. I decided I do the background research to know where this is going. Best schools is a man that was an atheist started that. So they ranked him 30. So I guess he's the prestigious scholar who will tell his students now, don't be overcommitted to the Bible. By the way, you can look up all of this to trace if, if Dave is being, you know, look, challenge me, look me up. Uh, look up these things. There he is right there. Uh, I'll skip that. What's the impact in the pulpit and the pew? You're going to be hiring those preachers one day because the preachers that are today are going to have to turn over their pulpits one day. And the seminaries that are producing this are going to be your choice. And I think, you want my opinion? I think the churches ought to be training their men and forget the seminaries. Now I've made all the board here mad. <laughs> because churches stay faithful and seminaries after that third generation start going down. At least the local church, we have a better shot because most of you, if I believe, I can see this, the people here, and I believe if that kind of preaching was in your pulpit, any of you that are closed carry would be open carry immediately. <laughs> here is my response to them saying, it's bibliolatry. Well, I'll tell you what's worse than bibliolatry. I'd rather be a bibliolater than a scholar. That's what it is. Uh, I'll, I'll wear the Billy Bob teeth and tell people that I am a junkyard dog and I'll point them to the word of God as inerrant and I don't care what they think. I will honor God and we need men filled with God's spirit that will honor God no matter what the cost to their personal academic reputation. And you need to hire men like that. 
and good luck finding them as these seminaries crank out these degrees like they do. Preacher all a tree. Anyway, you, uh, let's go. So, by the way, how can you be a bibliologist when God said, I have magnified my word according to all my name? Um, was Paul a bibliologist? And I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. Oh, I know. Let they tell you that we don't know. That's not true. Ed Linneman wrote a great article showing that it was always Paul. The word of God is alive and active sharper than a double-edged sword. Listen to me, just by speaking forth God's word, and I don't mean in the charismatic, those name and claim of you, the power of God's word. How dare you, bibliolatry. At the name of Jesus and his word, every knee will bow. I guess the psalmist must have bibliolater when he said, but my heart stands in awe of your word. And the NIV got it right. Trembles at your word. Okay, let's get in another thing. And again, this is only the first one. I got two more nights to go. I have only, and it's not personal to him. I got plenty. He's, an, he's a really, yes. How many? I got five minutes. Okay. When I was teaching through with the book, some of my students raised their hand. And by the way, they don't call me uh, Dr. Farnell, they call me Maximus. My favorite movie, Fundamentalist Love Violence, right? Gladiator. You ever seen Gladiator? <laughs> you know, so I have his curus. I have it. I noticed the sword here. I have the, the uh, you know, the, all those kind of, and the curus he wore in the movie, or at least a ripoff of it that cost me so much, my wife threatened to take eBay off of me. So anyway, <laughs> I was noticing, the kids were raising their hand, why does Dr. Wallace say BCE and CE? before the common era and common era instead of B.C. and A.D., before Christ and after Christ. You know, our whole dating system in the world is A.D. and B.C. honoring Jesus Christ. Even the United Nations <laughs> uses that. Doesn't they? Don't they? Even though they have some temple to something in there that I don't know. So, Dan finally replied in an article. You can go to Bible.org. You can see his reply. I just took it from there. He says that using Jesus' name in dating, you know, he wants his book for a wider audience and using Jesus' name is like the uh, Confederate flag stars and bars. I don't want to have something that's off-putting like that. Please read that for a while. He says that's an imperfect analogy. And that, yeah, I agree with that. Nothing personal to the stars and bars. Trust me, I don't mean, I just mean Jesus' name is holy and sanctified. And by the way, he says, you know, uh, the apostles didn't date by Jesus' birth and death, but do you think the apostles would have removed? If they could date by Jesus, they would have removed his name from dating? There it is. So it's stars and bars. None of the apostles he said ever used ACBC. Please go to Bible.org and it's AC and BC or whatever, you can look at it there. In a pluralistic society, more and more people don't even know what BC and AD mean. Fewer know what BC and e, uh, BCE know, but we won't get into that. Third, many of them are offended by the Christian message. Well, listen to me. I serve a, I serve a man that said, if they hate, I'm the master. If they hated me, they will what? Get used to it. And I'm sure making that. So, stars and bars. Um, <laughs> Jesus is the rock of offense, and most people stumble at him. Uh, okay, I've got to keep going because I only have five minutes. We can forget that. Now we've got to go to the resurrection of the saints. Now, here's what I want you to do tonight as an assignment, which you won't. You'll fall asleep like I will. Um, go to Matthew 27. Read Matthew 27, 45 through 56, and just list there what happened at the resurrection of the saints. I mean, what happened at Jesus' death uh, in Matthew 27 and just ask yourself in plain normal interpretation what happened and then I will introduce you to Houston Baptist University. Ooh, where am I? I'm glad some of you are open carry and others are concealed carry. I may need to ask you for your services but where? how far is that away from here? You're kidding. Uh, Franklin... <laughs> Franklin, get the car and open the door. But here is what, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Lycona, prestigious scholar. I'm a junkyard dog. He says that in the, uh, in the Gospels, 
Here you go. You ready? Didn't happen. And you ready? In other things, Mark is, are you ready? Confused. Now that, I hope you'll come back tomorrow night because I'm going to play him. I quote people so that you know I'm just not making this stuff up. I wouldn't believe it if I didn't have what I had in here. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm finished. I'll turn it over to Dr. D. <laughs> but we've got, this is just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions. Anybody have any? Yeah, don't pack up yet. Don't run out the door. I forgot I was in Houston when I did this. Yeah. All right, does anybody over on this side have any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, Robbie. Do you think that uh, the rejection of the authority of the Bible has resulted in the rejection of inerrancy or the other way around? Off my microphone. I think we need to stop calling everybody doctor. I think we need to start calling everybody a servant. And I think we better emphasize to our men in seminaries you are God's man, no one else's. And what I think is producing it is the fact that. There are many so highly intelligent men, and they go for these uh, very elite degrees, and then they believe the press about them. If anybody knows the press is true about me, it is true. I'm a junkyard dog, and these guys are 10,000 times more smart than I am. But until we get our seminaries wake awoke into that, and we don't want them to be, it's not wrong to be a scholar, but Scholarship is merely a means of glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, it's becoming an end in itself. And so what starts this is they believe, in my personal opinion, the press about themselves. They, I, am, I am a graduate from this elite school. You're not. Uh, I'm the guy that knows everything. You're not. And then the SBO guys, the theological left, controls theology. And like the lemmings, if you want to be written, you don't know the hardship I have to get a book written because I'm one of those knee-jerk fundamentalists. And that was the favorite term at the seminary I graduated with for my doctorate was they love to call people like me knee-jerk fun fun fundamentalists <laughs> if you disagreed with them. I heard that in the New Testament department while I was there. In other words, we're the elite. That's how I interpreted it. You're not. And either you agree with us or you're... A knee jerk, and what is a knee? It's an unthinking response. Well, I've thought about it. <laughs> and I don't want to be advocating what you advocate because you're going to stand before God. And they need a fear of God. These professors need a fear of God. They don't have, they have an elite club that wants followers, in my personal opinion. So that's how I'd answer that. It starts with a heart condition and leads from there. Yes. Uh, will you talk a little bit about um, theological interpretation and um, the uh, the Van Hooser thing? Because, because and Trier, th there seems to be, um, on the one hand, we commit to inerrancy. On the other hand, they're messing with hermeneutics in a way that you lose the text. I'm not an expert in Van, Van Hooser, so I got to admit, man's got, Clint Eastwood, man's got to know his limitations, okay? <laughs> Let, oh, let me, uh, Clint, you know, man's got to know his limit. Okay, all I can tell you is we'll talk about speech act theory, and that's the fancy way they do it, and I'll explain speech act theory that they used, you know, it's like a lawyer. No matter what you say and no matter what you sign, a lawyer can always get out of it. And speech act theory is like a lawyer, and I'll show you how they do it. By the way, that's uh, David Rosen. He's working on his doctorate at yes, Baptist, are. and he's doing the presentation tomorrow. <laughs> on Scottish common sense Sorry, realism. I just quickly read, so. well, you, well, you did a great job. I mean, those quotes are good because this is what the other side is doing is they're constantly saying, just dismissing dispensationalists as well as inerrantists, saying, oh, you guys just got that because you're Scottish common sense realism. You've been influenced by, you know, just the, the Enlightenment, and that's all there is to it, and they just dismiss us, and Dave's going to show that that's not true. Okay, thank you, and... Um, uh,